Welcome once again to Faith Fellowship Baptist Church, and this is part four of Psalm 37, A Quiet and Confident Trust in God. So let's hear again these powerful statements from David as he writes in verses 1 through 8 of Psalm 37. Fret not yourselves because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourselves, it tends only to evil. Well, our focus this morning is on verses 7 and 8. In verse 7, is we need to learn to be still before the Lord. James Boyce quotes Blaise Pascal and says, The basic problem in our world today is that people do not know how to stay quietly in their own room. In other words, people want to get out. They want to do things. They don't want to be still. They want to move. They want to act. They want things to, 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 they want to make noise. They want things to happen, and they, they can't wait. Here in the Psalm 37, there's a need for quietly waiting upon the Lord. Remember, the overall theme, I think, of Psalm 37 is simple two points, simply two points. We need to look up more, take our eyes off ourselves, off the world situation, and look to the Lord. And secondly, we need to develop a long-term perspective on our life and what God is doing, both in our lives and in the world. We wait for so many things today. We wait for our cell phones and iPads to recharge. We have been made to wait in lines uh, that we are not used to at the stores during this COVID crisis. Uh, we're waiting for doctors to call us back, people to schedule appointments or surgeries. In Brandon, sometimes we even have to wait for a train to cross the tracks. Uh, perhaps David had to wait at a sheep or a goat crossing. I don't know, but he had to learn how to wait on the Lord. He had already been anointed by Samuel to be king, but he had to wait seven years before he was king over all of Israel. Joshua and Caleb had been promised the promised land, but they had to wait 40 years to enter and enjoy that promise. Abraham and Sarah had to wait for a son. Israel had been promised the Messiah. They had to wait. The church has been promised the Lord's return, but we still have to wait. Verse 7 says, be still again. And it says, be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Living a Christ-like life, in part, is learning to be still, to be peaceful, in both heart and mind. It sometimes means that we need to get rid of the distractions and the things that pull our attention away from the Lord. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 talks about the weights in our life. They're not necessarily things that are wrong, but if we spend too much time on them, pay too much attention to them, they will distract us and often cause us stress and worry, anger, or frustration. The verse says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses in the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. At various times in my life, and in yours as well, I'm sure we've experienced how the Lord can make us lie down. Psalm 23, verse 2. He loves to lead us beside quiet waters, and, and we enjoy the blessings of those quiet waters, but sometimes we don't want to slow down, and he makes us lie down to restore our souls. Well, the book of Lamentations is not often read, but it ought to be on our current need-to-read list. It's divided into five laments where the prophet Jeremiah tells us about the sad state of affairs in his nation and in the city of Jerusalem. There's a lot of parallels and insights, I believe, to what's happening today in the book of Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 3, though, is different from the other four laments because chapter 3 becomes very personal. It's not just about someone else's city. It's about his city. It's not just about someone else's people. It's about uh, Jeremiah's people and about himself. It's a very powerful moving chapter as he responds personally to the suffering of his people. Philip Graham Ryken writes, Jeremiah's personal lament is a reminder that suffering is always personal. When nations go through times of tra tra tragedy and tribulation, the greatest suffering always takes place at the individual level. Jeremiah is moved to tears. He's distraught, angry perhaps, but certainly as he writes, he is losing hope. Verse 17 and 18, you have moved, he writes, my soul far from peace. I have forgotten prosperity. And I said, my strength and my hope have perished from the Lord. 
the New Living Translation does verse 18 this way, everything I hope for from the Lord is lost. Jeremy is telling us of his personal testimony that the wicked and the workers of iniquity have destroyed everything that he's dreamed about, everything that he hoped for. And, Jer and Jeremiah says, I have no more hope. I have nothing to look forward to. Even my hope in the Lord is gone. Riken writes again, however, that last exclamation seems to have brought a change in Jeremiah's melancholy mood which shows the importance of hanging on to God even in the midst of suffering. The mere mention in verse 18 of the divine name Lord had a dramatic effect on the prophet's outlook. He could not forget the bitter trials that he has faced, yet before the weeping prophet fell into utter despair, he remembered God and God's perfections. In verses 19 through 24 read, The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. But this I recall to mind, and therefore I have hope. What is he calling back? He says, through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. <clears throat> These words remind us of a well-known and much-beloved hymn written by Thomas Chisholm, um, who lived between 1866 and 1960. Uh, perhaps you've heard of it. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not, and as thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, thy mercy, morning by mor morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, your hand has provided. Great is your faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Like Chisholm, Jeremiah had learned centuries early of the wonder of God's providing care. Jeremiah's words are the words of a survivor, a man who had suffered great evil and injustice without abandoning his confidence in God's faithfulness. Because Jeremiah had suffered so greatly, he was able to better appreciate even the little mercies in life. Robert Browning Hamilton wrote, I walked a mile with pleasure, she chattered all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow and ne'er a word, said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. Through Jeremiah's sorrows, he had learned more about the nature of God. He was learning how to praise God for his love and his faithfulness and compassion. And he learned more about the mercies of God that every day held something new and fresh and a fresh expression of God's constant care. And Jeremiah was able to learn also from his sufferings because he had endured them patiently, learning to be still before the Lord. His testimony is a reminder of the blessings that come to us from waiting on God. And finally, in Jeremiah 3, he writes, The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. And it is good, I like this verse, it is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Christians who suffer do more than suffer, they also wait. This is not the passive waiting of stoic endurance. It is rather an active resting in the goodness of God with the hopeful expectation that someday one's trials will be over. There are times when the only thing a sufferer can do is to wait upon the Lord. But waiting is good because God is worth waiting for. His salvation will come in due course, provided one surrenders to his will and to his timing. And for David, that's the point of Psalm 37, verses 7 and 8, of resting in the Lord and waiting patiently for the Lord. It's what Jeremiah expressed to us in Lamentations chapter 3. And the only other option is to become a worrisome, nervous wreck filled with anger, frustration, and unfulfilled desires. It's your choice. Jesus says the same thing to us in the New Testament. In John 15, he tells us to abide in him, to remain in him as the branches in the vine, to deepen our, our love and our appreciation for the life and the vitality that, that he gives to us. So we might say, I want the job now. Jesus says, be patient. I want my health back now. The Lord says, trust in me to do what's right. I want the rioting, the brutality, the nonsensical acts of violence to end, and I want it now. God says, be patient, be still. Trust me, be still before me. And for the righteous in verse 7, to worry about those who prosper from the, their wickedness, we, it's almost like we've forgotten what he said in verse 2. Let me read it again. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. 
to be consumed with worry and fret over the people that do the wicked things is very short-sighted and demonstrates a lack of trust in the Lord. But the instruction for the righteous goes even beyond this. The righteous are instructed as well to turn away from anger and forsake wrath. That's verse 8. Because it only leads to evil. Because such unrighteous behavior, attitudes, and reactions do not solve the problem, they just add to the problem. James addresses that in James chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. He says, So then, my beloved brethren, let everyone be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to get angry, or slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Getting angry, being filled with anger and rage, looking for ways to vent or seek revenge, that's not God's way for God's children. Responding to evil with more evil doesn't produce righteous behavior. Believers have to take a stand on a different platform. We have to speak words that are of a different language, a, a language that speaks of love and forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Paul writes in Romans 12, Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. We have the only message that will make a truly meaningful, long-lasting, eternal difference in people's hearts. And it's in the heart that all of the change needs to begin. Jesus wrote, or the Lord wrote to us in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. And I think the, the application is still applicable, although we're not a Christian nation per se. We are Christian people. And the Lord says, if my people, those who claim to know me, to love me, to serve me, uh, want to see change in their nation, then I want to see change in them first. Let me read it again. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, and that's sometimes the tough one, then I will, God says, then I will hear from heaven, then I will forgive their sins, and then I will heal their land. Well, Paul says in Romans 2 verse 4 in closing, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? And I think in Psalm 37, the Lord is saying that God is giving us time to do what is right. We need to learn how to trust in the Lord. We need to learn how to delight ourselves in the Lord. We need to learn how to roll the burdens and concerns and worries of our heart over to the Lord. And remember, God is never late and he's never in a hurry, Adrian Roberts said. So that makes sense. Because in verses 7 and 8, David says we must learn too to be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Dear Heavenly Father, there's so much turmoil and so much violence today. We pray that you would open hearts to receive the gospel message that would bring, pre, pe, that would bring peace and reconciliation to the souls of restless people. But help your people to deal with our own hearts first so that we might be able to respond with doing good and speaking good in a way that would please you. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.